The woodland caribou is an elusive animal. It is rare to catch a glimpse of one in the forest. Woodland caribou are distinct from their cousins, the barren ground caribou, that are often portrayed thundering across the tundra in herds of tens of thousands. The woodland herds are much smaller than barren ground herds. There have never been large numbers of woodland caribou in the West. And as their name suggests, they prefer a forested habitat to the open tundra. Caribou are members of the deer family, the only ones where both male and female have antlers. A set of antlers can weigh 22 to 30 kilograms, and they can grow to a length of 130 centimeters. Antlers are shed and regrown every year. There is much speculation as to the purpose of the antler's fantastic shape. Caribou are well adapted to northern environments. One adaptation is their large crescent-shaped hooves, which make traveling over snow and bog a little easier. The hooves also make great snow scoops when digging for lichen, but they are a little tricky on ice. Woodland caribou, weighing up to 270 kilograms, are larger than barren ground caribou. The average lifespan of a caribou is five years, but they can live to 13 years in the wild. There are 14 woodland caribou herds in Manitoba. Each herd is named for its location or range. Because of the caribou's elusive nature, the size of each herd is only an estimate. At one time, woodland caribou ranged south through the Whiteshell Provincial Park down into Minnesota. Today, you will not find them south of the Winnipeg River. Woodland caribou are a threatened species. In 1984, Kosiewicz, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, classified the woodland caribou of Western Canada as a vulnerable species. In the year 2000, that was changed to threatened. Four of Manitoba's 14 woodland caribou herds are considered high risk. The Kisissing Neosap herd, Waboden herd, Atikiki Barrens herd, and Owl Lake Flintstone herd. Two serious threats to woodland caribou are increased predation and introduction of the brain worm parasite, both of which may occur from habitat changes. If the forest is burnt or harvested in a way that provides improved habitat for moose or white-tailed deer, those species will move into the area. This will bring more wolves. White-tailed deer will also bring in the deadly brain worm parasite, deadly to caribou and moose, but not to deer. In woodland caribou country, Manitoba Conservation prioritizes caribou over both moose and deer. A third serious threat to caribou is loss of habitat. If forest fires burn a large section of a herd's range, the impacts could be devastating. Before woodland caribou were classified as vulnerable, Manitoba had begun studying the caribou to identify ways to best manage and protect them. In the 1970s, the province started some of the first radio collaring of woodland caribou done anywhere. The information gathered helped managers determine the habitat caribou preferred. This early information was used to establish the route of the first all-weather road on the east side of Lake Winnipeg. Much of the early data collected is being substantiated by today's more technologically advanced research. The Eastern Region Woodland Caribou Management Committee was formed in 1994. It is a diverse group that works together to direct research and make management recommendations that affect woodland caribou in eastern Manitoba. Its aim is to balance the needs of the caribou with those of various resource sectors. The organizations working in partnership on the management committee include Broken Head First Nation, Hollow Water First Nation, Black River First Nation, Sag King First Nation, Lac de Bonnet Wildlife Association, Manitoba Model Forest, Tembeck Forestry Company, Time to Respect Earth's Ecosystems, Manitoba Transportation, Manitoba Hydro, and Manitoba Conservation. Dr. Vince Crichton, senior scientist with Manitoba Conservation and member of the management committee, has studied woodland caribou for more than 30 years. The biology of woodland caribou, and this includes their numbers, is what contributes 
to their status as a species at risk. Manitoba has never had a lot of woodland caribou, with numbers ranging from anywhere from a couple dozen in individual herds up to about a thousand. The Owl Lake herd, for example, at the last count, had a population that varied somewhere between 65 to 80 animals. Because of these low numbers, woodland caribou are susceptible to things such as increased predation, uh, uncontrolled hunting, um, diseases that may be introduced onto their range, and uh, for large catastrophic events that, like uh, habitat fragmentation and um, fires that occur in the landscape. And I should point out that woodland caribou have a very low reproductive rate, which contributes to their low uh, population numbers. Because of this, woodland caribou have little cushion to absorb a major blow. In order to find out more about the woodland caribou, its habitat preferences, and what kind of disturbances affect it, the management committee is utilizing two research approaches, or knowledge bases. They are traditional ecological knowledge, tech for short, a form of indigenous knowledge, and academic science and technology. Julie Bartlett, an anthropology student at the University of Winnipeg, has been using tech to research woodland caribou. Traditional ecological knowledge, or tech, is the information that resides within Aboriginal peoples in all their communities. It is the sum total of knowledge that they have gathered through time and is essential to their survival as a people, both in the past, the present, and the future. Traditional knowledge uh, represents generations of experiences and careful observations. Using tech, I have found some interesting correlations when you look at maps that show the boundaries of the boreal forest and compare it to maps that, that plot out the places where you could find pictographs and petroglyphs within Manitoba, those sites fall within the boundaries of the boreal forest and actually follow the migration lines of caribou as well. Julie has been hired by the Centre for Forest Interdisciplinary Research for the Caribou Tech Project. This project was commissioned by the Caribou Management Committee to gather information about woodland caribou in eastern Manitoba. The Caribou Tech Project is recording traditional and current knowledge of woodland caribou in eastern Manitoba for our educational, archival and planning purposes. We hope First Nation communities will continue to share their knowledge with us as well as utilize existing information for community land use planning. Our goal is to accurately portray what the elders know and make it available in both Ojibwe and English to the community, schools, universities, government and industry. We would particularly like to learn from people who are part of the Caribou Clan. Lawrence Smith is an elder with the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation. My clan is caribou. It's important for me to know that who I am and what I am. Our elders in the past talked about the clan system. Each clan has a responsibility and my responsibility is to see that the environment in the forest and the bog areas and grasslands the water, rivers, and lakes, they travel through there because this is where the food and medication is. Carbo Clan, is, to me, it's important. Kelly Leavesley is the Regional Wildlife Manager for Manitoba Conservation. In her research, she's using state-of-the-art technology to track caribou in order to understand their habitat. Kelly chairs the Woodland Caribou Management Committee. Woodland caribou have a low reproductive rate and a very narrow ecological tolerance. So they require special attention when planning and implementing resource developments. Since the early 1980s, the focus of our management and research has been to understand the habitat and range requirements for woodland caribou. Woodland caribou typically use different areas throughout the year, so we need to understand how they use these areas, why they are important, and how these areas change over time. We want to know what habitat types are important for food and cover, so we need to identify where their wintering areas are, 
where the cratering sites are located, the areas where they dig for food through the snow, and where their loafing sites are located, the rest areas where they regain their strength. We also need to identify where the calving and calf rearing areas are, where the important rutting areas and migration corridors are, and how they use their habitat to escape predators like wolves and bears. As we gather more information about their habitat needs, we get a better picture of what we should and should not do in woodland caribou habitat. The research has provided us with a great deal of information about woodland caribou. For example, we've learned that lichens are a very important food for woodland caribou in winter, but in summer they also eat leaves, shrubs, herbs, mushrooms and grasses. Summer and winter ranges do not usually overlap. Some herds use traditional migration routes, but others do not. Summer habitat includes open areas and ridges to get away from biting insects. Caribou have a loyalty or fidelity to a particular area for their winter range as well as for their calving areas. They prefer mature coniferous forest habitat for cover and food. Cows disperse by themselves to give birth and they return to the same calving sites, often an island or an island of trees in a large bog. Calf rearing areas are usually near water, on islands or along shorelines, providing cows and calves an escape from wolves and bears. Woodland caribou are moving all the time, and they use their landscape more than other animals do to avoid predators. When wolves threaten, they disperse widely through the forest, making it harder to find them, or into the water if it is close. With the help of Manitoba Hydro and Manitoba Model Forest, the committee is using state-of-the-art technology to track the caribou by satellite. Global Positioning System, or GPS, collars are put on the caribou to track their movements. After one year, the collar is retrieved. The data stored in the collar's onboard computer is then downloaded to a mapping computer program. Then, the caribou's movements over the year are put onto maps. These maps identify important core areas and migration routes of the herd. They help the committee define management zones. The maps help plan for future use of the forest to ensure adequate habitat is available for woodland caribou. The tough part of the job is finding the caribou and getting the tracking collars on them. Trevor Barker, wildlife technician with Manitoba Conservation, explains the different types of caribou collars. This collar here is one of the very first collars uh, we've used as an electronic collar. Um, what it is is a VHF collar. It has a specific frequency assigned to this collar and uh, through using antennas and receivers uh, we can hone in on the animal and uh, track it down quite efficiently. Uh, we, through that we get uh, herd numbers, herd sizes, uh, calves uh, numbers and such. This collar here, the much larger one, is the very first GPS collar that we've experimented with. It is the GPS 1000 and uh, with this collar it was necessary to have a laptop computer and a separate modem for this uh, collar to talk to it while it was still on the animal. Uh, this collar uses GPS to uh, locate the animal and it communicates with it four times a day and uh, it tells us where the animal has been and, and uh, what temperature and uh, how many movements per hour it was using. Um, this was the very first one, so it's very bulky, very heavy, but it was very efficient. Through time though, the GPS collar has evolved. It's uh, now maybe a quarter of the weight that it once was. Wildlife biologist Doug Schindler has been studying woodland caribou since 1982. He's been actively involved on the Woodland Caribou Management Committee and in the range mapping research. We began our research on woodland caribou in southeast Manitoba in an area that's known as the Owl Lake area. The Owl Lake range is south of Bassett, north of Pine Falls. Uh, and currently we're focusing uh, much more on the areas to the north, north of Bassett, up towards uh, Blood Vein, Barrens River and uh, areas in towards Poplar River. Woodland caribou occupy these areas on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and uh, we have a global positioning system collars, the latest state-of-the-art technology on those animals now. 
In this particular case, uh, we have a uh, caribou identified as Attica 1, and in this particular instance, uh, the uh, caribou has been plotted uh, according to its GPS location points. We're able to plot these locations onto uh, various maps, and uh, we can uh, determine its movement, the types of habitats that it's in, and uh, we can uh, do a fairly sophisticated analysis in terms of habitat use and uh, movement on the animals. For instance, we can uh, take these data and we can zoom in on a particular location where the caribou have been located through the GPS collars and you can see all of the data points. We can also assess the habitat that the caribou are utilizing by looking at the habitat characteristics. In this case, we're using a habitat suitability index model and we can plot the locations relative to the habitat uh, suitability index, how the habitat is, is valued. We can also look at how caribou move across the landscape by plotting their movement patterns. And in this particular instance, you can notice that these caribou do roam a lot. And we can basically connect the dots and determine how much time that caribou spend in each of those particular habitat types. And it helps us to assess the value of that particular habitat. From the data that's been collected from the GPS callers uh, over the years, we have been able to uh, identify uh, to some extent some preliminary ranges and some well-defined ranges. The Owl Lake Range, which is in the southern portion of our region, south of Bassett and north of Pine Falls, uh, is a fairly well-defined range and we've got a lot of good data on that particular. As we move further north, we're starting to identify that animals do utilize uh, particular areas and ranges. The, uh, the Attico sub-range in green is an area that uh, seems to be utilized by a, uh, a group of caribou, approximately uh, 40 to 50 animals. Uh, we also know that there are another subgroup that we call the bloodbane subgroup, which summer and winter pretty much in the same area, as opposed to the Attico range, which has a tendency to migrate from summer range into winter range. As we move further north, we've got the, uh, the Round Lake and Barrens Range, which we are just starting to understand a little bit further, that within the Round Lake area, the area in black is a group of uh, probably uh, 50 to 70 caribou, which utilize this area. They do uh, uh, summer and winter within the same areas, and they also do extend their range. This one is one particular animal that has gone on a fair distance in terms of finding a summering area. That's a cow. As we move north, we've had a bull that has operated up in an area adjacent to the lake. And this particular animal uh, is uh, quite interesting in its movements. You can see the path by which it moved very quickly from the spring into the summer period. And at that time, the collar uh, uh, ceased to work because of the batteries running out. But essentially, you can see on the east side of Lake Winnipeg that we have uh, developing a picture of some distinct ranges for woodland caribou. And uh, only through the use of this GPS collar technology are we able to uh, get this fine of detail or range delineation from, from, uh, from the collars. So it's uh, fairly spectacular in terms of the data that's being gathered and, and the, our ability to, to learn and understand these, these ranges. The collaring program continues to work its way north. The information gathered from the Atikiki Barrens herd is being used for land use planning on the east side of Lake Winnipeg. The more data on the caribou's core areas, the better the management strategies will be. This state-of-the-art research comes at a cost. The groups sharing these costs are World Wildlife Fund, Tembec, Manitoba Model Forest, Canadian Forest Service, Environment Canada, Manitoba Sustainable Development Innovations Fund, Manitoba Hydro, and Manitoba Conservation. At a government level, the information is being used to improve provincial guidelines and policies for forest management and park planning. Tim Swanson, forester with Manitoba Conservation and member of the Caribou Management Committee. Manitoba Conservation applies an ecosystem-based management approach in forest management. Caribou are an important part of the boreal forest ecosystem and so any management of the forest involves managing caribou as well. There is evidence from our research that responsible logging activities in caribou can coexist on the landscape. The information from the GPS callers tell us where the caribou are active or potentially active. We use that data when we are developing forest harvest and renewal plans. Caribou are an important element of the forest management planning. 
Bruce Bremner, regional park manager, also a member of the committee. Within provincial parks, there are land use categories or zones that determine the type of recreational and resource extraction activities that are permitted. The wilderness and backcountry land use categories do not permit logging, mining, or hydroelectric development. In Nopaming, we have uh, established a backcountry land use category which protects the caribou habitat for summer calving areas. And in uh, Atakaki or Atikaki, we have uh, the whole park as a wilderness park and uh, that's to afford protection for the caribou, the Sasaginiak caribou herd. Uh, in addition to that, as new research and information is gathered, it will allow us to uh, adjust our land use categories to afford the proper protection for the caribou in Nopaming and Atakaki. At a resource industry level, the information is being used to improve forestry practices in areas with woodland caribou. Dr. Brian Kotak is a biologist with Tembek at Pine Falls and a member of the Caribou Management Committee. The research that the committee has undertaken helps us to alter our harvesting techniques in areas that might be used by woodland caribou. A measurable prescription based on caribou habitat requirements has been developed that allows us to assess planning strategies and then continuously measure the results over time. We are developing a large-scale experiment based on the committee's prescriptions to assess the response of caribou to different logging patterns. It is hoped that harvesting patterns which more closely approximate the natural patterns produced by forest fires will enable that habitat to be cycled over time while maintaining the Owl Lake herd. This ambitious project is the first in Canada to do this. Vince Keenan is a forester with Tembek and a member of the Caribou Management Committee. This research has, uh, has helped us develop management strategies that benefit both the caribou and allow the resource industry to, to keep operating. Uh, for example, the committee wanted to make sure that, that we only had one access into the operating area. So we, we looked at uh, which was the best option and then decommissioned some other roads that could possibly have access into them and uh, enforced legislation that put gates and barriers on the one existing road into the area. We're also going to implement some specific harvesting practices to try and protect things like the lichen on the site. So what we'll be doing is trying to avoid equipment operating on these sites, but at the same time having them reach in and do some harvesting to allow more light to come in and actually produce more lichen on the site. We want to implement some forest renewal practices immediately after harvest to regenerate a forest that's more friendly to the caribou. We don't want to create a site that will attract animals like moose and deer that may bring in disease like brainwork. The members of the management committee have diverse interests, but they are all committed to making the best possible decisions based on accurate information. Peter Miller, member of the committee and representative of the environmental organization TREE. Woodland caribou are highly symbolic of the wild things that we value and want to protect. In order to translate that concern into proper care, we need to base our actions on real knowledge. And when we have that knowledge, we must be committed to using it, not just in parks and protected areas, but across the entire landscape. The extent to which we can keep our forests caribou friendly is one measure of progress in forestry. Woodland caribou, an elusive resident of the boreal forest, is one of the province's little known species. To traditional First Nation people, the caribou is part of the clan system, and those that are caribou clan must take care of the forest landscape, protect it and maintain it. To the ecologists, the woodland caribou is an indicator species, representing the health of the boreal forest. As a threatened species, we need to take more than a glimpse into the life and well-being of the woodland caribou. Based on extensive research, the Eastern Region Woodland Caribou Management Committee is developing an integrated land use plan to protect the caribou for future generations.